Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. It's one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, so you must be watching Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness Mark. And every week we bring you some exciting science from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, focusing on both the Earth as well as the planet. And uh, we've got some really exciting science this time from around Hawaii. So my guest today is Rhett Butler, who is a geophysicist and a seismologist at the University of Hawaii's HIGP. So first of all, Rhett, welcome back. Thank You've you. You've been on the show before. Happy Easter. Number four. Number four. And it's great <laughs> to have you here. And today we are going to be talking about earthquakes. Yes. And in particular, earthquakes around Hawaii. Yes, little ones. Little ones, <laughs> all right. <laughs> and in preparation for today's show, I started looking a little bit about Hawaiian earthquakes. Right. And there are lots of them, right? Quite a few. Actually, most people don't realize how many earthquakes we get here if you compare it to California or even Japan. We get quite a few. Yeah, and this number, is primarily large because most of the quakes are relatively small. Well, it's actually, whether you count big ones and small ones, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. It's really the big island is where the action is. And most of our earthquakes happen there, and the rate of seismicity on the big island is comparable to both California and uh, Japan. Okay. In terms of per unit area. Per unit, and uh, your job description is both a seismologist who presumably studies earthquakes right. and a geophysicist. The two are related, presumably? Well, yeah, physics of the earth is geophysics, uh -huh. and the tool, or my tool, is typically seismology, which is from shaking. Seism is the Greek word for shaking. Okay, so. and we've had people like Niels Grobe, who is a geophysicist, and Gerard Fryer, who studies oh, yeah. earthquakes. So you're a combination of two of our previous guests, right? Uh, something like something that. Something like that. Something well, like that. I have broad interests. Let's put it that way. Right. Now, um, you brought along the first slide, and I think this will get across to our viewers a little bit more of some of the scale of the earthquake. So um, yeah. describe to us here, we've obviously got a map of the Hawaiian Islands. I think uh, Gerard Fryer actually made this map years ago, but this shows the major earthquakes that have happened since uh, 1850s. So as you see, most of them are on the big island. The larger the diameter, the larger the earthquake. We've had earthquakes up into the upper sevens, seven, right. seven, seven, eight. And uh, the smaller ones there are like sixes. But you can see over time, there's quite a number of events. Not so many out on Oahu where we are, but more concentrated. And, the, and the numbers on this diagram relate to the numbers at lower yeah. left. So for example, number two was a Lanai earthquake, 6.8. That's pretty yeah, big. Uh, yeah, that number two is a 6.8. That actually, when it happened, it uh, jarred the foundations and partially busted up Punahou School years. This is back in the, the day. Really? And no, number six, June 28th, 1948. A 5.2 just off Waikiki? Yeah, uh, it would have shaken things up. I was not around here then, but uh, but there's some uncertainty of the location. But yes, it would have really shaken up Waikiki. And, and that would just be a regular earthquake or a submarine landslide? Or? Uh, no, that would be that would just be a regular earthquake. All of these are regular earthquakes. Uh -huh. uh, it's Although it's really clear we have submarine landslides, if you just look around the bathymetry of the islands, we've not really had one which we've clearly seen on the seismic record that this is a landslide. Okay. So we suspect them, we've not seen them. All right, and um, there, there's a lot around the Big Island mm -hmm. which are apparently quite large, right? Number, yeah, they get up to nine, the sevens. The 1975 Kalapana earthquake, 7.5. Oh yeah, these are huge. It's actually a 7.7. Seven we we, we listen to the news and you uh -huh. know, when you have, say, a magnitude 7 quake in Japan or Indonesia, that's pretty big news. Right? Oh yeah, it always Can appears be. as a potential tsunami alert and then they always announce that it's it's too small, but yeah, it's always recognized that you get in the upper sevens, you can get tsunamogenic effects quite uh, quite easily. All right, and, and we, what we were seeing there were perhaps the top 12 earthquakes, which in sort of uh, since Western contact 
have occurred within the Hawaiian Islands. Is that the sum total, or how often do we get an earthquake? Mm, well, the larger ones, we haven't had uh, a really big one since the uh, event in, two, I believe it was 2006 in October. Mm -hmm. So that was a 6.8 or a 6.9, and it caused a fair amount of damage. And which woke me up. And yeah, so. yeah. See, I never experienced earthquakes. I was, of course, on the mainland while this happened and called in information from California as opposed to being here to actually feel it. Oh, but, I uh, see. Yeah. Huh. And the second slide, I think, will elaborate a bit right. on this point. Um, just how many earthquakes take place? And this, I believe, we get this illustration from Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. Yeah, I, I get a view of this in my office at UH. And, really? uh, we're getting earthquakes all the time, but most of them are really small. They're the ones and twos and threes. And so if you're right on top of it, you can certainly feel it, but it's harder to, to see those things up with the island and, chain. And what we're seeing here again is sort of the eastern Hawaiian islands uh, and the colored symbols, whether it's the white circles or the green triangles or yeah, they are different times? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, some of them is depth. It depends on the some color scale. But, but so but this it looks is, like this one is... Uh, th is this is from... The, the oldest quake, which uh, is on the list on the right, is from March 15th of this year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that implies that we might have had a dozen measurable oh, yeah. earthquakes of magnitude two or three, which yeah. quite we, we can't feel, correct? If you're on the big island, potentially you'll feel them. You won't the feel them island. up here on Oahu, because we're just too far away for the energy to come up here. So, so why is the big island suffering so much from earthquakes? Well, it's, it's, got, it's, got some mad, it's got some of the largest volcanoes on the planet. Okay. Okay, and as it builds the volcanoes up, the, the uh, internal stresses are such that uh, eventually uh, things fail and you get an earthquake. We, we have the local uh, volcanic effect earthquakes, and then we have the earthquakes where you pile up a huge mountain and it presses right down on the lithosphere of the planet. And then you get earthquakes that we call deeper ones here, where they're 30, 40, even 50 kilometers down just from the massive weight of the islands. All right, so it sounds as if there are two different ways yeah. in which we could get earthquakes. On the big island, obviously, we have right. Kilauea active today and Mauna Loa may erupt in a year from now sort of thing. But as the magma comes from deep below the Earth's surface, that can actually break rock and oh, yeah. force its way. So that's one type? It's one of the ways you can tell a, a, an impending eruption if you see seismicity coming up right. to the top. Yes, yes, yes. I've, I've heard some of the HVO geologists describing right. how they might be able to predict Mauna Loa erupting again. Oh, yeah. And then the second style is that because of the, the weight of the lava flows that are already on the surface. Correct then it's like pushing down on a yeah. pillow on a bed. You, ba basically, it's, the it's islands giving, are heavy way, and it's giving it, way under and its own weight. It causes stresses to be accentuated in certain places, and those can then become earthquakes. OK. And you know, um, we see in that slide, there might be dozens of earthquakes uh, of relatively small scale right. every day. And, and you mentioned earlier, how does this compare to places like on the US and California, where we always think California's seismically Right, uh, yeah. I mean, challenged. we really do have quite a number of earthquakes here. And when you're looking at the little ones, you have to remember that every time you go down a magnitude, and you go from a three to a two, you get 10 times more twos than you do get threes, and you get 10 times more ones than you get twos. It's basically, so most of the energy, uh, I mean, most of the numbers of earthquakes, the small ones happen a lot more often. Mm -hmm. So we, even though on that one plot, which goes back to about uh, 1850, well, there's a lot of them on there, but uh, if you counted the number of small events, it would be huge. Okay, and, and the quakes which we saw on the first slide where we were basically seeing several around Maui, oh, one, yeah. one off Oahu, is that due to the same sort of subsidence of the islands? Exactly. 
you're still seeing uh, the shallow events are still more involved in the structures of the islands themselves as they were built into volcanoes and, uh -huh. and fractures within that structure, whereas just the weight of the island creates deeper events. And those are the ones we typically see. Uh, well, we see them around the islands. Actually, we've seen them even here on Oahu, little ones that are, are substantially deep. But as your job's a seismologist, this must be a wonderfully fertile area of the planet to actually do oh, yeah. seismological it's, research. This is a fantastic what, 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 what kinds of things do you try and understand? Is it um, the, yeah, how the weight of the islands can cause quakes, or can you learn anything about the interior? Well, yeah, I mean, if you, it, small events, it, it basically tells you things have happened, it, but yeah. you can't really look at the details because they're so small, you only see them in a couple places. Larger events, you can look at the whole mechanism of the earthquake, which tells you the state of stress around that point and gives you an idea of uh, how the weight of the island is is interacting with the stresses for the whole Pacific uh, plate as it's moving around. So it's a it's a it's a great interplay now, between the two. We've had Bin Chen on the show in the mm -hmm. past, and Bin. Uh, does high pressure mineral physics looking deep into the Earth's interior. Your kind of seismology, can that actually learn something about the Hawaiian Islands or the ocean plate upon which the islands well, are Well, I mean, or? when you look at these, you're always trying to put them in the context of other bits and pieces of knowledge. So it'll tell you about the velocities, which can tell you something about the mineralogies. Uh, if you see absorption of energy, such that the sounds don't travel as far, that tells you something about temperature, and once again, about mineralogical states. So, although you have a focus on, you've learned something because of the earthquake, you try to relate that to other things you know about the planet. And so it's part of a whole picture. And where you say temperature, presumably you could detect whether or not you can identify the plumbing system of one of yeah, the Yeah, that would be right? the help. help yeah, the magma you... chambers underground will be hot, so maybe right. transmit seismic energy. So it, it's, it, it changes the velocity of the, which right. sound propagates. It changes how fast it attenuates with distance. All of these things have three-dimensional structure associated with it. So, so this is sort of a, a good introduction for the audience on seismology in Hawaii, but obviously you're doing active research. Mm -hmm into seismic uh, studies. And mm -hmm. I think the third slide will actually show us, um, as we get ready for the break, we can go to look at this third slide. And let's just sort of uh, yeah. walk some of the, the viewers around. Um, the scale well, bar should be 100 kilometers down at the bottom right. But yeah. we're seeing here, what? Well, I mean, last year, and many of us remember that there were some earthquakes felt in Kailua on that side of yeah. the island, and they were little, they were little magnitude four earthquakes, uh, bigger than threes and twos, of course. And the uh, little red balloon there, number seven, was one which occurred on March the 9th, basically um, a year ago. And it was a 4.7, and it was well, f well felt around in Molokai and on, the, on Oahu. And so I went and looked at that particular event just out of curiosity, because you could feel it, you could talk about it, you could go look at it. Uh -huh. And so ultimately, I ended up finding some very interesting things about that earthquake. So I went back and said, well, let's look at the rest of them that happened in that area. Because, I mean, there have been a number of these things that have been happening recently. So you pull up the events out of the data, and we have a seismic station at the Aloha Cable Observatory. All right, the, with the, the logo there. So right. this is... So this is a observatory on the seafloor. On the seafloor. This is the deepest one on the entire planet. It's uh, at about 4,800 meters. It's really deep. And it's connected to Oahu by a uh, retired telecommunications cable that the university acquired from AT&T and then put all the equipment uh, connected it to the cable. So this observatory is about 80 kilometers north of Oahu. About 100. About 100, okay. And just to help the viewers a little bit more, um, we're looking at the structure of the ocean floor north of Molokai and yeah. uh, Oahu. The numbers represent where you found... Right. It, each one is a different earthquake, and but they are all have occurred since uh, 2013. And, and they seem to cluster um, that those blocks 
on the ocean floor. Yeah, I mean, that, those landslides. are massive landslides that are uh, probably a million years old. Uh -huh. And so, yes, there's surface features, but the earthquakes themselves are very between 10 to 30 kilometers deep. So they're much deeper than the surface fish okay. features. And, and, and finally, just as we get ready to take the break, the, mm -hmm. the KIP on Oahu is, oh, an that's a, is another uh, seism seismograph, right? Yes, we are blessed with one of the global seismographic network stations on the planet. It's right here in the center of the island and near Kapapa Gulch, which uh -huh. after which it's named. And so we have a standard reference station to compare what we're learning on the oh, seafloor right. with what we're learning from a standard. So, so when we come back, you're going to describe a bit more of what you've discovered with these yes. earthquakes. OK, so um, it's time for us to take a break. So let me just remind you all, you're watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark, and my guest today is Dr. Vet Butler, who is a seismologist and a geophysicist. And when we come back, he'll tell us all about these Molokai earthquakes. So see you then. Hey, hey, baby, that's you. I want to know, will you watch my show? I hope you do. It's on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock, and it's out of the comfort zone, and I'll be your host, R.B. Kelly. See you there. Hey, aloha. Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy in transportation, energy in maritime, energy in aviation. We have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. But we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii. Uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stand the Energy Man and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Aloha. <music> And welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark, and my guest today is Dr. Vet Butler, who's a seismologist and a geophysicist at HIGP at mm -hmm. UH Manoa. So, Vet, we set the stage before the break on trying to study specific earthquakes north of Molokai. Right. So maybe you can sort of lead us through the, sure. the, the next slide, gets into some data which I have no idea at all what it means. So <laughs> you, you can help me here if we can go to the next slide. Um, oh, these are these are what we call seismograms. In okay. other words, that if you starting at the left and then going to the right, that's time moving forward. So you can see it's a very flat line in front of the left one there, and then it, all of a sudden it happens and you see a, a bunch of different things that are happening. You see arrivals that are coming in at different times. Some of them are going straight to the seismic to the station. Some of them are bouncing in the ocean. Some of them are different velocities. So, and but, let, let's explain, I think what we're seeing mm -hmm. is the left-hand diagram that's is right. from Station Aloha right. deep so, on the ocean floor. That's right. It's a hydrophone listening to the sound of that earthquake. And, and Kip Z is the monitoring station on Oahu. Right, it's the Z, we use Z for vertical components, so it's measuring vibrations vertically. Okay, now, why are they different? It's the same earthquake. Yeah, but you're, they're, well, they're different, they're sampled at different rates. The one on the left, the hydrophone, is actually sampled at a 24 kilohertz, which is incredibly fast, 24,000 samples per second. The one on the right's 100 samples per second. So there's a lot more high frequency information. The, well, the one on the right, Kipapa, that's a standard seismic station. If you, we won't go into all the detail, but because it's on the island, you're not getting the reverberations in the water. On the uh, left one, you can see a lot more arrivals. That's because lots of the energy is reverberating in the water. So the energy is coming from down beneath the crust. 10 or 30 kilometers, mm -hmm. and then it's coming straight up to our seismic station. And then once it hits the bottom of the seafloor, it just bounces up and down after that. Okay. So we're primarily interested in just the direct energy, because it's the, quote, simplest part of the whole path. 
And the thing that made this one particularly interesting is when I got the inf got the uh, the recording, it was the extraordinary high frequencies that were in this. And what I mean by high frequency is, typically if you're in seismology, almost all the sound that you get from earthquakes is below human hearing. Mm -hmm. Humans' hearing is about 20 hertz, so most of the noise is really deep, okay, and you can't hear it. Whereas this particular earthquake, these Molokai earthquakes, you could hear, if you think about a keyboard, you could hear all the way up to middle E. Huh. In other words, really high frequency up to about 170 hertz, which is very unusual. So that it's like the difference between you walk into a room and you hear these deep bassy notes versus listening to the whole orchestra. And so it's rather extraordinary to get to see that. I'm right. Now, um, for more background for our viewers, we've had Milton Garces on mm -hmm. recently talking about infrasound, right. which is the same low frequency sounds, but in the atmosphere. In the atmosphere. So seismologists would do infrasound through the Earth's crust? Well, it's the same principle. Same principle. I mean, the, okay. in, when the, the vibrating atmosphere is a fluid, yeah. okay, and it only has one velocity, the acoustic wave velocity. Vibrating solids have many, many vibrational modes. And so when you're looking at seismic waves, you're looking at a whole bunch of different things that are not expressed in either the air or the water. Right. But I love your analogy with, say, a, pian a pianist right. who's playing the entire keyboard from yeah, the sound. Yeah, it's, it's rather remarkable that you can hear those kinds of high frequencies. And uh, you're hard pressed to find a a, uh, an example out there anywhere else on the planet where you see these kinds of high frequencies. So and I was rather struck when I saw it. Is them. that because there aren't many station alohas scattered around the Well, planet? that's part of it. Part of it is that we have extraordinarily few seafloor observatories, and so just this kind of recording is not available to most scientists. You measure things mostly on land when you're yeah. doing deep sea so deep, when you're doing global seismology. There are very few actual stations in the, so, in the so ocean. So the land uh, confuses the signal, well, or there's so much background noise. The noise, it's noisy. It's noisy. The surface of the Earth is a noisy place. Uh -huh. If you go deep into the Earth, it gets a lot quieter. If you go to the bottom of the seafloor, it's still a lot quieter. And if you're at the surface with the wind is blowing and the thermal thermals are happening and you, the waves are crashing into the side of the island, it obscures what you can hear. And uh -huh. so you don't get to hear these high frequencies. You get to hear just noise. So we got it. So this was kind of like a picture into the sound of what it would really be like if you didn't have all of this noise at the surface. And I know you've brought along another fascinating slide. Mm -hmm. If we can go to the next slide, trying to visualize what these. Well, what I what, are. what I was looking at in this, and this is what we call a spectrogram. Yeah. The vertical axis is frequency, so it goes up to 200 hertz. Okay. 200 hertz is about middle C, approximately. Right. Okay, and yeah. the bottom of there is, is around, it goes below a, a few hertz, and that's, in other words, you're off the bottom of the piano there. You can't hear anything. And so you're seeing the full range of this one signal. Now, to the far left, that's the background noise, and there's just colors. That, that's the, the solid yellow. That's, that's and, the noise. And okay. so if we just subtract off the average noise, and then you basically paint it all blue where, you, it's, where it's noisy, you can have the signal sticking out here, which is really clear. This very clear at zero time because it's very close. We're very close to it. And and the colors, and in particular, I it's guess you're looking at the red. Yeah, red, red is, is power. So red there's power. more so power. How strong the signal right? How is. strong the signal is, and as 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 you go up in frequency, the signal diminishes, but relative to the blue background, you can clearly see it above the noise. And so I looked at that and I thought, wow, I've never seen anything that high before. So that, and that, then the, that was the impetus to go look at nine other earthquakes in the mm -hmm. area. Is this a it, unique it, event or is this is common? Is this a technique the, that's commonly used by seismologists? In, uh, well, more people that work in the oceans use these spectrogram techniques. Okay. But uh, it, it's used, it's not unheard of, it's not, routinely used. And what, what do you learn by looking at this? Is well, this basically it tells you whether frequency content versus time. Uh -huh. So you can get how much energy there is. It's the color. 
which you used to paint right. it with. And then the time and the frequency give you information about what you're actually seeing from that earthquake source. And, and, and the power is not instantaneous. Does this mean that you might have slowly cracking rocks propagating an earthquake or um, that is at different depths or, or how, it all depends it you know the earthquake source is a it ultimately are measuring the uh, re the release of stress yeah and it's it's catastrophic in the sense that it doesn't just, just start it starts and it propagates and you the the further it goes the bigger the earthquake is and as it turns out the the way that that rupture propagates actually makes an important role in how much energy you get out of it. Typically for earthquakes when we're seeing it, we're seeing something that it's rupturing at a very, it, it, it's the, the, the velocity of that wavefront is changing all the time. It's, 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 you can think of it as a jitter and as it jitters it creates all those high frequency noises. Okay. So at low frequencies you can see that, in other words of all those notes in the piano that you can't here, I mean, they're, they're below the, the piano hearing, uh, you're looking at that jitter. But one thing we've learned out of this is if we look at the higher frequencies now, we can get a different view of what's happening. And I think you mentioned you looked at nine different quakes. Yes. Let's look at the next slide, which will show us. First of all, uh, yeah, this is a cutoff that. figure. So on the left is what we call P waves. Those are the fast things that go through the Earth. Okay. And the S waves are slower. Remember I said that there's a couple, there are at least two velocities of solids. Yeah. They travel at different speeds and they both tell us different things about the earthquake. Now we're showing this as a function of frequency and the left side shows what we have seen always before. We've never seen the high frequencies. And the numbers, so the left side is like seven, the seven, ten, four, they're the they're, 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 stations. Or the they're airports. the numbers that were on that earlier yeah. okay, slide. Got it. So each of those, you can look at them, they're all basically falling off of the same rate. That's omega squared, omega to the minus two. What that means is that as frequency increases, the uh, amplitude is decreasing. So okay. it's, it's losing energy at a certain rate. Okay, and this is what you would see just from Anywhere Oahu. around the planet, All right. if, if you were looking at earthquakes, just this kind of decay rate in the spectrum. And I think what you found by looking at Station Aloha is shown in the final slide, yeah. which should go, next slide please. So I uncover the part. There we go. And we've basically not seen this part of the earthquake spectrum. And what happens is you see that because we have these very quiet conditions for these very small earthquakes, we're actually seeing information in the earthquake source that we've not seen before. Now I mentioned that at lower frequencies for the larger events, the velocity is jittering as the earth is cracking and there's this wave spreading, it's, jit it's jittering, it's not moving smoothly. If it just propagated at exactly the same speed, it'd be very little energy. It's that jitter that creates all the energy. So would the layperson in the street, would she be worried or excited about this discovery? I wouldn't be worried about it. It just, it's an interesting phenomena. And I think f from my perspective, it's not so much that the that we're looking at something unique about the earthquake source. We're looking at something that's unique about Hawaii's uh, attenuation of the energy. In other words, we can see the energy, so therefore it hasn't been attenuated here. And we've seen that something has changed at about 50 hertz. So it, once again, you go up your keyboard here and you go up an octave or so, all of a sudden the way that the earthquake is expressing its energy has changed from like the slope has changed. And what it means is part of the energy is dependent upon the jitter and the rupture itself. But at higher frequencies, you're looking at something much smoother, and that's what's shown in the actual spectrum. And so presumably seismologists like yourself get a much better picture of the way earthquakes propagate through um, the, the line, primarily because we've got Station Aloha and the university right having this fiber cable to a real-time monitoring station. Yeah, we, so it's a great resource for... So we get to see something that, unique location, close to Oahu, very interesting results, 
and they say something very directly about the earthquakes we're looking at, but also the crust that it exists in. And you, you've uh, admitted the fact that we've got seismologists who know how to interpret the data. Yeah, well, in principle. I'm sorry, we're running out of time, <laughs> so let me just thank you again. Always I know a you've been back on the show uh, a number Look of times. Look forward to doing it again. Look forward to seeing you again soon. And let me just remind the viewers, you've been watching Think Tech Hawaii, Research in Manoa. I've been your host, Pete McInnes-Mark, and my guest today has been Dr. Red Butler, who is a geophysicist and seismologist within the University of Hawaii's HIGP. So until next week, goodbye for now, and see you in a week's time. Bye.